Welcome to Radical Feminist Perspectives. Today we are going to consider the book Against Sadomasochism, a radical feminist analysis. It's a, an anthology from 1982 edited by Robin Ruth Linden, Darlene R. Pagano, Diana E. H. Russell and Susan Lay Starr. It's going to be discussed today by Marion Rotigliano and Lier Keith. So uh, welcome everybody and over to you. Oh, mm -hmm. Marion, yeah, you're still muted. <laughs> All right, I am now unmuted women will speak um good morning everybody um this is against sadomasochism um published in 1982 it's a collection of essays um that were published between 1975 and 1981. snm or snm um used to it just used to be called snm um there was also something called B and D bondage and discipline, which initially was sort of a separate thing. And the people who were into B and D were careful to tell you that they weren't into that S and M. And the people who were into S and M kind of scoffed at just being into B and D. And then eventually it sort of all became one happy dysfunctional family of BDSM. Um, so the book, this book <laughs> deals a lot with uh, less, less lesbian S and M though not only but it's all applicable and particularly so in some ways to heterosexual relationships. <clears throat> S&M um, originated among gay men um, primarily, although it was certainly present in, uh, in heterosexual literature and action before that, um, but it began infesting lesbian community in the early 1970s, women's movement, um, moving to the mainstream from there as it was eagerly adopted by heterosexual men who convinced heterosexual women that S&M was part of being sexually liberated. Um, Unpacking Queer Politics uh, by Sheila Jeffries is a, a really good um, accounting of how this all happened, and I, which I found revealing because I lived through all, all those events and um, couldn't and knew something was wrong, couldn't figure out at the time what was wrong, but that put it all together. But this book, again, Sadomasochism, um, is a collection of essays, as I said, by early feminists um, some who went on to be well-known um, and author more works and some that did not. There are a few personal accounts by women who participated and practiced sadomasochism. Um, only, only the masochists uh, are, are represented and they reflect on how it affected them and what it means for women. There is an essay as well, I should mention, by a student who was working on her PhD in philosophy at Yale University. She wrote as Judy Butler, um, yes, it's who you think it is. Um, it's interesting to see this fledgling effort by someone who uh, grew so much more ponderously abstruse in mostly avoiding any but the most basic feminist analysis. There's only one essay by a man, John Stoltenberg. So the things that that you know that we deal with when we talk about sadomasochism are um, at at its foundation the eroticization of dominance and submission, um, the meaning of consent and sex roles, what used to be called sex role stereotypes that we now call gender. So um, we can look at these with the material analysis of radical feminism. Um, one of the, in, in terms of the eroticization of dominance and submission, you know, I, I tell people to ask, your, ask yourself, where do you think it came from? Where do you think the idea came from that men are supposed to, you know, because it's usually, it's almost, it's almost always men, um, but it, um, got trans translated into male male relationships, male female relationships, female female relationships. Where did it come from? Um, one of the essays is by Kathleen Barry on the history of cultural sadism, and she she gives a brief history of the life and the sadistic practices of the Marquis de Sade, um, which is um, expanded in a lot more detail in Andrea Dworkin's book um, Pornography. It's pornography. Um, uh, she talks about Freud saying that sadism can be understood as part of a theory of sexuality, which he based on the work of the early sexologists, Havelock Ellis and Richard Kraft Ebbing. I apologize for the history lesson, but it's kind of important um, because these guys somehow determined that it's like a law of nature that in sexual relations, men are impelled to inflict pain on women and women desire to receive pain. They only applied this to heterosexual sex and said that it was not applicable outside of sexual relations 
that didn't last long, did it? Um, Freud took this to a theory of men's sexual activity being hampered or repressed if he respects a woman uh, so that men only have full sexual potency, release, and pleasure with a lower type of sexual object like women he doesn't respect. Sadism for, you know, for his uh, theory was not the perversion of a few, but a basic psychosexual characteristic of all men. Um, with male socialized sexuality um, being at, at its core domination and the violation of boundaries by pain and humiliation. So there needs to be for men, according to Freud, a separation of love and tenderness from sex um, and a degradation of the sex object. And it's a chicken egg, you know, it's how much of this really existed beforehand and how, how much did Freud invent and was it really just a feedback where the flames were fanned? Um, T. Grace Atkinson, um, really brilliant women, gave a talk in a meeting of a group that promoted sadomasochism, the Oil and Spiegel Society. I was at that meeting. I was I think I was a junior in college. And she, um, I'm going to read um, some of these things because these women were so brilliant and their writing was so phenomenal. Um, she, she said that, you know, they, they wanted to liberate themselves. They said, we need to be liberated. She said, you claim the necessity to liberate yourself from a false shame imposed upon you by a hypocritical society. You claim the pervasiveness of sadomasochism throughout society and insist your rightful place within the framework of that society. You claim that you are psychically in tune with mainstream America, but you protest that for no justifiable reason, society won't let you play openly in the band. So your enemy from which you wish liberation is one of attitude. Your enemy is not the establishment, we say the establishment, that patriarchy per se. In fact, you claim as your life force the distillation of the essence of the establishment. Your enemy is the resistance of the establishment to recognize you as one of its own. Um, so it, we knew, feminists knew back then, um, and that, that the eroticization of domination, submission of violence towards women um, was the foundation of, of S&M. Um, do you want to speak more to that, Claire? Um, the, no, no, it's fine. I'm just trying to trying to gather my thoughts because I was on a different track with this. Um, that's a really great intro to this book. I mean, she's you've done like a really nice little book report for everyone there. Um, I think for me, well, like when this book came out, it was such a relief because the SM thing had already just exploded everywhere. And I just seeing, I remember going to New Words Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts and finding this book. And I, it just was such a relief to know that somebody somewhere knew this was wrong. <laughs> um, and I don't think this book ever got the amount of play that it should have. The Samwa shit just went everywhere. And for those of you who aren't in America, Samwa was the original Pat Califia group that was the sadomasochist group in San Francisco. And they were sort of the, the like the hell mouth for all of this stuff that just came pouring out of San Francisco. But they were the ones who said, oh, this is liberating for lesbians to do this. And uh, isn't all, this isn't all, this is so wonderful. So she of course is now a man. She's pretending to be a man. Um, so she was one of the early doctors of, of prunism as well. So that, uh, you know, no surprise there, right? What, what do we think all of this is about? Um, anyway, so that, uh, yeah, this, but I, I did enjoy just knowing that this book was out there. It made me so happy to buy it and just to feel like I wasn't crazy because I was just in utter despair seeing these women um, put on Nazi regalia and play master slave games and telling us all that this was somehow liberating. I, to me, as a radical feminist, the, the absolute center of patriarchy is that eroticization of power and domination that that and that's the core insight that radical feminist has, have, feminism has, that all these structures of oppression, we're never going to get to the bottom of them if we don't see that men are eroticizing this. So whether it's racism, whether it's misogyny, whether it's the destruction of the planet, they're getting a sexual thrill out of this. And it's a horrible realization. I mean, it will depress you for years. It's hard to climb out of that hole once you go down it. Um, but it is the truth and it is what we figured out as radical feminists, and we need to keep saying it. So women taking up these kinds of practices, I just could never see where, where is the hope now if women are going to do this too. Um, so I, I love that this book existed and I, I have not reread it in a long time. So it was nice to take a dip in because 
I got a lot of good arguments out of this book in 1982. It really helped me figure out, you know, actual language to use when, when we were going to argue about it and argue we did. So, yeah, and, and no, unsurprisingly, um, in a way, uh, the other um, really historical piece of the puzzle was provided by Judy, Judith Butler, um, mm -hmm. who talked about in her essay, hearing Gail Rubin speak and finding out that Rubin was influenced by Michel Foucault um, and that he provided the theoretical basis for the gay S&M movement. Um, Foucault and S&M, um, if you don't know, um, so that there's no sexuality without the expression of power as domination and submission, and that these power relations are natural. She talks about her personal experiences also, and this is not specifically related to um, uh, erotization, but um, Judith Butler says that um, I've never done S&M as it is institutionalized, that is with all the equipment accoutrement and jargon that goes with it, but I've felt the passion and intensity that has gone along with certain dominant submissive power dynamics in my own sexual relationships with women. I've always felt ambivalent about the power imbalance that drew me, and I've even tried to legislate such desires out of existence. And then she talks about something that, I mean, we can get into later that has to do sort of with consent, where she says, there are two voices to be heard here. The one saying, I should not want this, and the other, but I do. The S&M side says to get rid of your guilt, the last vestige of puritanical authority, and the moral feminist side assures you that you have merely learned to want this, that as your socialization changes, so will your desire. Um, and there's a lot of talk in this essay and some of the others about the rightness of desire, that if you desire it, it is good, that we desire gratification. Um, eroticization, um, is, is normative um, because it's, it, is, it is encompassing. Um, remember that um, Havelock Ellis and Kraft Ebbing said that the, you know, the, the violence, the need to inflict pain and humiliation was specific only to sexual relationships between men and women. Um, we know that through a host of, um, I should have numbered these things better. We know that through a host of, uh, of social um, changes, including in, in particular pornography, for example, that um, men are indoctrinated into the sexual power they have over women and, and porn as well as male socialization teaches men to maintain that power. Women get indoctrinated with the idea of romantic love, romance novels starting in the 1930s. Um, and now romantic love, you know, in marriage to men is, is protected. You read the romance novels and there's always this dominant guy who sweeps the woman off her feet. But in all of it, the man is dominant and the, and the women, women submissive. Um, the, it was, there's an essentialism to it um, that, that's inculcating these beliefs that says that, you know, men are dominant and they can't control the sexual urges. And women are passive and submissive and always want to be dominated and raped. But in this essay by Sally Roche Wagner, Pornography and the Sexual Revolution, um, she notes that S&M is not a kinky deviation from normal heterosexual behavior. Right. It's the defining quality of the power relationship between men and women. Sadism is the logical extension of behavior that arises out of male power. Sadism is the end stage result of unconstrained male socialization and male socialized sexuality. Um, masochism as a choice by women is taught to women social, via socialization in media as sexual liberation. Um, and, the, and the debate becomes, you know, how dare you, um, you know, police my choices about my body um, when we know that, you know, autonomy really means the, you know, the, the idea that you have the right to decide what can and can't be done to your body. In medical ethics, autonomy primarily has to do with the, the um, ability to say no. You can't at least theoretically force doctors to treat you in a way that they think is inappropriate, but you can say no to completely appropriate treatment that will save your life. So autonomy is really the right to say no. I've been talking a long time. No, it's good. <laughs> Everything you're saying is exactly right. I'm gonna back up to Judy for a minute. Because there's this moment where she seems to understand things that she clearly later forgot. Um, yeah. It's just, there's, there's moments of real clarity in this essay. And then she just dribbles away into just sort of things that you, it's just absolutely vague. So it goes from super clarity to super vague in the same paragraph. 
and she's clearly confused, but there's like this moment, I, I've marked this one passage where she says, what is problematic is that SM takes a non-reflective attitude toward sexual desire, professing to embrace quote, consensual choice and abstracting themselves from the real shared world, SM lesbians leave behind the possibility for concrete personal and political choice. Instead, we get a playing out of sexual fantasies as if the historical and political world did not exist. Strangely enough, what emerges is a clear picture of the power dynamics characteristic of the patriarchal historical reality that SM supposedly left behind. Right, so I mean, why do you think they're doing the master and, and you know, swastikas? I mean, they didn't just pick these symbols randomly. These are the worst things human beings have ever done to each other and they're eroticizing those symbols. So she's got it right there. And then the next paragraph makes no sense. <laughs> well, just, most of the rest of it doesn't make sense. Is, I mean, you saying? <laughs> the sentence right before that says, you know, that she's she's troubled. What troubles me about the attitude towards sexual desire that it's always right. be good is not so much the moral perils of taking the SM room. And then she talks about the problematic. It's it's the most feminist thing I've ever read from yeah. her. Um right. if you want to go on with, with Judy and with uh eroticization because I think that's really important and I think that um, if you understand that that relationships between men and women are um, in, uh, the, that the power relationships the men being dominant the women being submissive are eroticized um, it's it's tough to explain how that happens um, a lot of the essays in this book that I've discussed um, get to it and certainly the influence of people like um, Foucault um, and the whole, you know, what was initially just a Freudian analysis um, that that um, seeped its way into most psychiatric psychological theories. Right. Well, even the next sentence that she has after that passage, she says that SM requires consent does not mean that it has overcome heterosexual power dynamics. Women have been consenting to heterosexual power dynamics for thousands of years. So. She gets that it's the same model, you know, that once you eroticize power and domination and you institutionalize that, you know, into masculinity and femininity and into heterosexuality, it's like, well, like women are cons quote consenting to this all the time because it's how we've been socialized and it's how our sexuality has been formed. So why would it be different just because it's two women? Like they're making this extraordinary claim that somehow it's, you know, this desire is completely ahistorical, not formed by those same forces. We just happen to be choosing slave and master and swastikas, you know, so I don't know. I mean, consent, consent is actually, consent isn't the point. Um, consent doesn't make um, SM morally allowable. Yeah, um, right, exactly. It doesn't, consent doesn't change what's actually being done to someone. Yeah, um, I know, so, yeah. So there's the, the um, odd, um, logical, you know, uh, conundrum of um, these things when done to a person's body um, are always morally objectionable and harmful. Oh, but here's like, you know, the golden ring. If you say, okay, you can do it to me, all of a sudden it becomes all right. How does that happen? Yeah, this has been my problem from the very beginning with this. Like, I don't actually care whether someone says, I want this. It's not right to do this to any human being. It's just wrong to hurt people. I don't know like how they went so far astray from such basic, you're supposed to know you're not supposed to hit people. Like, I don't know, it's like, I feel like we're talking to kindergartners sometimes. It's wrong to hurt him. It's wrong to do that to her. Please use your words. Um, and they just, they think it's fine if somebody says I want it. And to me, it almost seemed like, well, it's very possible she does want it. That doesn't mean anyone should do it to her. It's actually horrible to do those things to people. Nobody should be hit or branded or tied up or burned or, you know, I, I, I remember once uh, sometime in the 80s stumbling upon this little manual. I don't know what it was called. And it was more like a little like what we would call a zine now. It was like more like a booklet than a real book. But it was a, like a it was like a little handbook for like S&M practice and care or something. I don't know what it was called. I saw it, of course, in the one. Oh, books. I know what you're talking about. That was just, you know, of course, just going to break my heart because there it was just in the feminist bookstore. Um, and, and there was just like step-by-step, step, like how to torture people. And then every section had what to do if you hurt somebody so badly that honestly they should go to the ER. And so the, the section that I will never forget was 
what to do if you fracture somebody's skull. And I just remember thinking, what are we doing, people? We need instructions on what to, you're gonna fracture somebody's skull and call that sex. And I'm supposed to pretend this is all okay. Like how you not just hit the brakes at that point in your life and think, what am I doing? This can't be right. Yeah, you know, one really important insight of feminism is, is that, you know, we say the personal is political and, and I, that's often misinterpreted, but it just means that our lives are shaped by yes. social structures. Yeah. Um, and all social structures, all of them are characterized by power imbalances. Your family, media, education, our personal lives and relationships are you know, also characterized by inequalities and power imbalances including our sexuality and sexual practices. So if we wanna get rid of dominance and submission in personal relationships, we have to get rid of the conditions that require and engender dominance and submission. That's one of the, in one of the essays by Karen Ryan about the social construction of desire. Um, she, you know, that she says that the debate is really between what is, um, what we used to say is politically correct, liberation, people can do S and M and not be criticized for it versus what is politically desirable. How do we want to treat others and to be treated in sexual relationships? Um, in the real world, in the material analysis of feminism, it comes down to bodies and lives and how do we want to treat other people? How do we want to be treated in sexual relationships? Um, all socialization, including love, is done in the context of power imbalances, parent, child, men, and women. Um, but that power imbalance has become associated with sex and with violence. So the, our goal as feminists, if you're, if you're a feminist, you know, radical feminist analysis is that intimate relationships, um, you know, where there are power confrontations um, are, are, you know, is not compatible with the way we want society be, to be transformed in loving relationships. S&M and femin feminism are just not, it's just not compatible. Um, cons as far as consent goes, I mean, you know, if our sexuality is constructed through social structures, with it, which it is, um, so do we all consent to some degree to sexual desires and activities which are really alienating? I mean, is that is that the way we want to treat others and to be treated ourselves? Um, there's a there are some real other really good essays about um, about consent. Do you want to speak more to consent, Leah? Well, what I always like to say is that consent is accommodation to conditions that we do not control. And liberation is the complete overthrow of those conditions. And we confuse those two things at our peril. That consent is not actually what feminists are after because you can get people to consent to anything. That's how power works. They only have to beat up a few of us for the rest of us to fall into line. You know, they only have to burn a few women as witches to keep the rest of us terrified for centuries. You know, they only had to lynch. It wasn't that, that many people. I mean, it's horrifying, whether it's lynching or witch burning or, you know, pick your public humiliation and torture, but it doesn't take much. And then we consent. And that's the entire point is to get our consent. So consent is, is this is not any kind of goal for a liberation movement. Women consent to all kinds of horrible things. It's... Yeah, that was I mean, never the goal. Like, I can't figure out why they think this is why the whole thing is so wonderful. It's because they consent to it. Well, of course you consent to it. That doesn't mean it's good. It doesn't mean it's liberatory. It doesn't mean it's actually a healthy thing that, you know, leads to a better life in some way. I just, they just missed the plot on that one entirely. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, just arguing that there are supposed, supposed positive consequences, pleasure, the desire and pleasure doesn't address um, objections to the practice of s &M. It just says that the ends justify the means, that you can do unacceptable, really objectionable, morally wrong um, things for a desired end. Um, and that, you know, the, and that, you know, you, you shouldn't have to follow the rules. Well, we know that, you know, there are rules of all kinds of social and, and sexual interactions, which don't negate freedom and, and rules make it possible to live freely in society. Um, sexuality is part of our socialization and rules within sexuality make as much sense as rules within society for being treated the way you want to be treated and, and treating others you know the way they're supposed to be treated so the, the feminist objection our objection to s m 
has nothing to do with whether or not people have the, the freedom to do it. Of course, they have the freedom to do it, but it's focused on the nature of the practice and actually what's being done. Um, I mean, this you know, presupposes obviously that something is morally wrong with patriarchal sexuality because that's where it comes from. The right. practices themselves are just the expression of what men do to women when they are unconstrained. Um, right. To carry it over, you know, a lot of these things have to do with lesbian relationships. To carry it over there is just saying, you know, um, that we're going to do what happens in, in heterosexuality. Um, and, and patriarchal sexuality involves a violation of women's right to determine what can be done with and to our own bodies. Um, so, you know, the, that, and that can, you know, they, proponents of S&M say that consent somehow changes the nature of what happens. Um, you're beating somebody, you're, you're, you know, you're humiliating them, you're causing them pain. And somehow, if somebody says yes, um, that makes it a different, you know, it makes it a different set of things than if she said no, um, despite whatever reasons she said yes. And the, the yes is, is not in a vacuum. We all know that. There's a, one of the, the um, essays in here that's from one of the survivors of this. Uh, her name is Marissa Janelle. I don't know who she is. I've never, I'd never heard of her except for this. I don't know what she went on to do with her life. But anyway, it's called Letter from a Former Masochist. And she was in this horribly abusive relationship that of course involved you know, massive amounts of, of violence in their sex life. Um, and, you know, some of the stuff, it's just, it's a very moving essay because it just sort of traces the whole process of getting out of this, like, absolutely wretched situation. But I'm trying to remember how SM became such an all-encompassing part of my life. How did I start losing faith in SM? When did I get scared? How did I get involved so deeply? I think I had doubts all along. There were always moments of uncertainty when I was turned on, but I knew I was frightened when I felt myself feeling less and needing more real pain to get excited. It's like drugs, you develop a quick tolerance to the pain, but worse than the physical pain is the verbal and emotional abuse. Humiliation is a big part of SM. And then later she says, she's got, clearly gotten the feminist analysis at this point when she's writing it. She says, I know that SM is very dangerous, especially when safe words like feminism are connected with it. It's insidious and it's more than just power and abuse and gratification. The danger is that our society puts women in the kind of space where <laughs> we respond sexually to being second class, less than good. There's something wrong with a woman who has an orgasm while, get ready, beating or fist fucking another woman. There's something wrong with pleasure derived from degrading nicknames like stupid cunt or fucking whore. What has happened to our movement when feminists spend so much time and energy building torture chambers, buying wrist restraints, is it still difficult? It is still difficult for me to digest my experience and make sense of them. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just this very, it's just, it's horrible. <laughs> I don't, I don't, at a certain point, I was like, this is horrible. Why are women doing this to each other? Um, I, I don't this, know. It's just gotten worse and worse because now porn is just, this was before the porn taker of her of the world. Now it's just utterly normal everywhere. I mean, breath play, you're supposed to choke people and call it sex and women are dying. Like, where did they think this was gonna lead? I don't know. Um, you're just gonna need more and more. Just like she says, you're gonna need more and more and more stimulation because it's a drug and you're not actually, it's anti-intimacy. Yeah. So you're running, you're running from yourself. You're running from your partner. You're just inflicting pain. You're dissociating. You just, it's an endorphin high probably. So this is just what you need more and more. And it, this is why the porn just keeps getting more extreme. So here's, you know, women in 1980 arguing that it's somehow liberatory for lesbians to do this to each other. Um, it, the, world has, the world has proven that we were right. It's just, we lost, that's the problem. We were absolutely right about how pernicious and horrible it is, but we didn't, we didn't win. I mean, it, there's a, we're still there's another, right and we're still fighting, but we lost. There, there's another um, uh, first-hand account of a woman who, uh, who describes her S&M experiences, Elizabeth Harris. Um, at first, she was with another woman, then she was with a man. And here's what she learned. She learned that S&M never touched her real emotional needs except for one incident at the very end that made her realize that her emotional needs were not being touched by any of this. And that's when she just quit and completely left S&M. 
um, she went cold turkey essentially. She also learned that thinking that s &M is psychologically or politically healthy is confusing ritual and real world pain and practice. It's just acting something out. She learned, she said that power that is negotiated in, a, in an s and relationship has little in common with power in the real world where power is taken by strength or force, not by contract. And she learned that s and at bottom is a rationalization of violence against women. Um, and you know the fact that she was able to quit, and I used cold turkey deliberately because it is very much like an addiction. Um, someone named Jessie Meredith in response to Sam Waugh um, said that she, you know, personally doesn't want you know dom and sub in relationships but she you know says that it, it when when it's um framed as just your desire and this is what i feel and it feels right and i want to do it that expressing feelings such that all feelings are okay is very very pernicious um because it doesn't con there is no analysis of the political significance of those feelings um there's no consideration of where where those feelings originate and whose interests those feelings serve. And ultimately, you know, one of the things people, for example, who are in recovery learn and in some, and in some you know, better therapeutic settings learn is that how you feel is not how you are. Um, right. So feeling that this is, that this is giving me pleasure um, may not be. And an addict, if an addict, if you give an addict their drug of choice, they will tell you, oh, I feel so much better. Um, mm -hmm. But you have made the addiction worse. worse. Um, and so the, the theory that um, S&M and this acting out of dominant submission, pain and pleasure is a catharsis and somehow gives a release um, is not supported, A, by that theoretical construct, but also by the fact that we know um, that behaviors that are repeated um, with, with um, extrinsic rewards like, you know, trauma bonding afterwards or, you know, or just um, feeling somehow like you're, you have some value as an object in relationship to someone, that that doesn't, that's not a catharsis. That just embeds the behaviors more and more and more deeply. Um, can yeah, say, every, time, every time you do that again, whatever it is, you're just getting those synapses in your brain deeper and deeper. And you're just making them more and more powerful. Yeah. And what we know about this is that the synapses never stop. Like once you've got them, once you create them. So for instance, once you link, sexual response and pain and humiliation, they never go away. You can build new ones. And if you let the old ones, if you don't give them anything more, any more juice and you create new ones instead, they'll eventually sort of calm down and the new ones will have more of a, you know, a hit for you, but they never go away. And this is why this stuff is so dangerous, is especially for children, you know, especially this, the porn culture with the phones and the 10 year olds and all that. It's once those connections are made, they're never unmade it's always going to be there in people's brains. And it's just, it's just incredibly sad that instead of resisting it, you know, you've, you've got people who just women who just throw themselves into this and don't seem to understand that this is, it's only going to get worse. This doesn't, this doesn't fix the problem of the trauma. And I have to say, like, I know you, you mentioned this trauma bonding and stuff. Every time I read the words aftercare in relation to this, oh. it just sends me crazed. Like, I'm sorry, sex is supposed to be the care. That's what it is, right? It's supposed to be this incredible experience of love and healing and intimacy and feeling known and seen and you're connected to the universe. And all of that is what we are given by having these incredible nerve endings and this capacity for joy and connection in a very hard world. Even the best of all possible worlds is gonna be a hard world because we all get sick and die. Everything changes. Like best of all possible world is still going to be hard to be human. And we're given this one thing that's like this amazing experience we get to have. And it's supposed to be the care. It's supposed to be the healing that, you know, makes up for having to be a grown up and do the thing every day. You're supposed to get this thing that helps. And it does help. And it's amazing if you can find a good partner and find that love. I don't know that I would have made it this far in life without that. And I feel very, very lucky for the sexual relationships that I've been able to have. I most women my age have just a string of abuse behind them. And I got really lucky because I found radical feminism. I want to give credit where it's due. Like it got me out of a whole bunch of horrible things I could have gotten into. And I didn't because I had books like this when I was a teenager. So when I hear aftercare, like you've abused your partner to the point where now they need what? Like cuddling and 
petting and oh i love you like that's what sex is supposed to be it's not supposed to be the thing you do afterwards to make somebody feel better because you just beat them up it just makes me insane i i know i i know the this um this supposed dichotomy that um you know um domination and submission makes sex exciting somehow and that without it you know without without the pain without the domination submission if it's so-called vanilla that that's somehow not exciting vanilla is the most common commonly and best appreciated ice cream flavor but but um certainly there are women who have not found not found that to be true they found vanilla sex is is more than passionate um um audrey lord um has an essay in this book also god so many brilliant women in this book and she was one of them yeah, she 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 actually quotes um, Eric Fromm, the only other male mentioned in the book, who says um, the fact that millions of people take part in a delusion doesn't make it sane. Yep. And, which which um, is great. And she says it's not a question of, um, again, of whether lesbians or any other women have the right to practice S&M. It's what it does to our lives and the implications of it, because, again, the personal is political. And she says we have been nurtured in a sick, abnormal society, and we should be in the process of reclaiming ourselves, not the terms of that society. And that you can't separate out this or any one aspect of your life from its implications, um, because sexuality is not separate from, from living. She, um, she says that uh, S&M is not the sharing of power. It's um, merely a depressing role replay of the old and destructive dominant subordinate mode of human relating and one-sided power, which is even now grinding our earth and our human consciousness into dust. Um, and she was very aware of, um, of, of, male, um, of male domination um, extending to more than just relationships, extending to, extending to how um, men treat um, treat women, treat the earth, treat treat everything they come in contact with. And the other essay that recognizes that, oddly enough, is John Stoltenberg, who says who, who notes that there's a causal connection between male sadism and in intimacy and male sadism in public policy. And right. you know, you 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 see that ecologically, but we also see that in laws that are made. Where do the laws come from that say um, in a rape trial that everything about um, the the victims sexual life can be explored in intimate, embarrassing detail where she can be badgered and harassed on a witness stand, but that the 16 other rapes that the, that the, um, um, that the alleged perpetrator um, is accused of, uh, that, that the alleged perpetrator, his 16 previous rape accusations can't even be mentioned. Where does that come from? Who made those laws? Yeah, right. Yeah, she has a, there's a great, little section here that Audre Lorde wrote, sadomasochism is an institutionalized celebration of dominant subordinate relationships. And it prepares us either to accept subordination or to enforce dominance, even in play, to affirm that the exertion of power over powerlessness is erotic, is empowering, is to set the emotional and social stage for the continuation of that relationship, politically, socially, and economically. So that really, to me, was the heart of, of why I have always hated this stuff. Cause it's just, well, we're just gonna keep eroticizing the same horrible stuff that we're fighting in the world. Somehow it's okay if we do this to each other, but we want a different world out here somehow. Like it just made no sense. I don't, how are you the gonna acts, get to this? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the acts themselves are just repeated over and over and over. Yeah. One of the essays by, and again, I don't, you know, Bat Ami Baran, um, who I haven't read anything else by her, um, said, you know, the, the consent of the participants amounts to no more than an agreement to partake in a practice whose nature is predetermined. You know, it's just, you know, it's just, you know what the ends are going to be, you know how it's going to work out, and it's over and over and over. And this and consent or supposed consent just formalizes violation of the right to determine what happens um, to one's own body, um, which I read before. It's just all role playing governed by, governed by rules so it's the same thing that happens over and over and over and over again every time um there is no opportunity for um any other emotional connection in other words the connection is only 
um, within these parameters. You know, I will dominate you this way. This is what we're going to do. I will uh, allow this to happen. Um, and this is what we're going to do. And that's all there is. There's nothing else to it. It's, it's you know, the addict with their, their drug of preference, they're only one drug. Yeah, it's uh, a bunch of years ago, Gail Dines and I uh, interviewed sex offenders in a supermax prison in Connecticut. And a lot of them were in for uh, crimes against children. And the woman who was one of the wardens of the prison was, this was like 19, what, I'm trying to remember what years, it was 2010 maybe? It was right before I moved to California, maybe 20, 2009. Um, anyway, um, the, ward, the woman who was the warden of the prison was really, really worried because she said that they were seeing things they'd never seen before. That up until that point, and she knew it was the porn. She said up until that point when men came into the prison and especially if they had abused children, um, they were very, like they were not, they didn't brag about what they had done. They didn't feel like there was shame about what they had. There was some sense that this was wrong. And that had completely changed over a few years. And, and now they just felt utterly entitled to the acts that they had committed. Like you couldn't find any way to get through to them. And she was really horrified. She says, we're looking at a tsunami here that I don't, I don't know what to, what, how to stop it. But some of them are willing to talk to you. So if you want to come in and you know, use them for research, they're open to it. So we went, we went and we talked to these guys and it was quite a day, let me tell you, to be sitting in front of like, you know, child porn guys. Like it was just like, okay, mind blown. But anyway, it was absolutely fascinating. But the thing that was really terrifying was how short it, none of them started as uh, pedophiles and they didn't on the ABLE score, they didn't even score as pedophiles. It didn't matter. It only took three months of looking at child porn and they went from looking at the material to offending. And I thought it would be a year, year and a half. Like even I was shocked at the speed with which pornography was able to do this, was just to be able to create, you know, predators of children. And they still, all most of them anyway, were still, um, you know, would have considered themselves heterosexual men who were attracted to adult women. Um, but it didn't matter. Like the porn got into their brains and then boom, it was done. So, I mean, that's the thing, like the more that you quote fantasize, you're actually, let's be real, these men are masturbating to this material. It's not just a fantasy. Like the entire limbic system of the brain lights up with sex. There's no stronger endogenous reward system than sex. And they're tying that to these images of violating children. So this was gonna end here, but I just had no idea it was gonna be that short of a pipeline. But the point that, that I really wanted to make, this, this is all that's backstory, because the point of this is that we were out, we were done with these interviews. We're sitting outside waiting for the, um, the car and I'm like, we're shaking. I mean, we're just like completely wasted for the day. Like we were both crying, I think at that point. And what they had all said over and over was, you know, I needed more, I needed more. I got really bored, I needed more. And then of course the algorithm shows them children. So they go there next because they're bored and they need more stimulation and they need more. And we all accept this, that this is, yeah, this is how the brain works. This is how porn works. This is, you could predict this would be true. And I'm sitting there on that curb waiting and it's cold out and like the whole, I don't know, just the whole thing. But it was like, nothing in my life matches this experience. I suddenly realized like, I have never wanted, oh, I need more, I need more, I need more. I was like, I think since I was 14 or 15 years old, the only thing I've ever wanted is like, look into my eyes, tell me you love me, we're good. Like, yeah. I don't need that 10 times tomorrow and then 20 times next week. That's it. That's the entire human experience of needing intimacy that all of us hunger for. And it was just so stark that what they needed was like, if you need something more and more and more, this is not good for you. It is a drug. It is something destructive to the human soul if you need more and more and more of it. And it just, I don't know, I don't know if I can, it was so stark in that moment, like what they were doing to themselves, what the porn industry had done to them, what they had done to these children. It was just, it's the hell mouth, you know? It's just the hungry ghost, like the Buddhists would say. You're never gonna get to the bottom of it. It's a void filling a void. Yeah, um, Phil I know who work in the jail say, it used to be just pretty standard that, um, you know, child rapist, for example, would be, um, would, would have the, you know, they'd beat the tar, other prisoners would beat the tar out of him. He was just an object of, they would revile him. Um, not so much anymore, apparently. Um, it still kind of happens, but not as much as it used to and not as unfailingly as it used to. 
I mean, well, you well, want you want to know an interesting little anecdote about that too. Was a, a friend of mine worked in the the prison that was I live in a town where there's a big prison, um, and he asked that he taught writing there, and he asked them. Um, so there's this, you know, we all hear this sort of this story about prison that you go after the sex offenders and they get murdered or killed and their lives, you know, whatever. It's you make it very unpleasant for them. What is that about? And they said to him very directly, you know, we're here because our lives went completely off the rails. We have done terrible things. You know, we know it. <laughs> you don't end up in a supermax prison without being a pretty horrible person. Um, a lot, and they would say that they said this in various ways, but ultimately this was the narrative that they all they all agreed to that. Um, a lot of the bad shit that happened to me when I was a kid, I could have gotten over. I might not have ended up here. The day my life ended was the day that man molested me or raped me. That was what destroyed my life. And they all know it. And when those guys come in, um, that's why they beat them up. It's not because they have some like ethic about, oh, you were super bad because you hurt children. All of them know my life was destroyed by you. There's no getting over this trauma. It has affected everything I've ever seen or done since. And, and that's it. You know, we're, we're going for you for that reason. It's very personal and also very conscious. Like that these men knew that that trauma was what did it. That it broke them and they never could put themselves back together afterwards. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm not, I found it curious that, that you know, when I was told that it's not, quite as unfailing anymore um i would think it would be um but you know what do we do i mean we have a feminist analysis and what do we make of that um and that same you know uh writer um who i was mentioning says that according to feminist theory in our conduct we enact cultural ideas about acceptable behavior by adopting given roles in a given situation um, in the case of sadomasochism, the idea is the patriarchal view of sexuality in which eroticism is connected with violence or domination and pain or powerlessness. Thus, patriarchal ideology is enacted in the sadist man role and the masochist woman role. And she goes on to say that the, the power of this oppressor class, um, male sadist, is dependent on the cooperation of the oppressed class, protected the same, you know, it, it, just sort of protect and is protected in society the same way slave you know slavery is protected in a slave-based economy so that individual and that individual members of the oppressed class um may suffer greatly and be destroyed but it's it's the um cooperation of the oppressed class and that this is not victim blaming this is what is enacted culturally and that our feminist analysis if we call ourselves you know radical feminists um understand that this is um essentially class warfare in a way or it's, it's just an oppressor class and an oppressed class yeah um the um the essay um, shortly after that by someone named hilda hein who i also don't know um asks you know we're analyzing this are the is the protection of the right to hurt and the legitimization of being hurt necessary consequences of guaranteed civil liberties should these be civil liberties because they are using others as a means to an end, usually an erotic end. Um, so she goes through an analysis. I mean, there's a would be a lot a lot to read, but um, ultimately um, comes to the conclusion that preventing S and M is like preventing a suicide. Um, and I thought about this because when you were talking about the guys in prison saying, "I know where my life ended," if you if that could be prevented as a society across the board, um, the the consequences of it all, you know, the prison and the and the repetition of violence, um, a lot a lot of the uh, you know deleterious societal effects, um, you could prevent like you prevent a suicide. Yeah, and the you read a little bit of this this essay, but I'm going to back up to the paragraph before because this is what I had marked. To degrade someone, even with that person's expressed consent, is to endorse the degradation of persons. It is to affirm that the abuse of persons is acceptable. For if some people may be humiliated and despised, all may be. It does not matter whether or not they despise themselves. To voluntarily make a victim of oneself is to endorse the state of victimization implicitly for others as well. And that really gets to the heart of it for me. There's um, an unusual essay sort of in the middle of it. Um, where Robin Morgan oh, yeah. uh, um, talks about her um, 
her sex fantasies. Um, she um, briefly, you know, she talks about her female fantasy. She talks about an early like consciousness raising group or something similar um, where one woman tentatively said, these are hardcore waivers, Ten woman said, tentatively said, you know, sometimes, sometimes I fantasize that, you know, that, you know, these masochistic fantasies. And then, and then the lead, you know, someone asked, does anybody else have this? And, and every single woman there raised their hand that they had had it. Um, although, for, you know, none of them, at least in that group, had acted upon it. So she briefly mentioned a number of theories of why women have fantasies of masochism um, and noted that it seemed a fairly universal or certainly ubiquitous phenomenon and how she tried to work through these theories personally. And she finally realized that she had zero arousal. She was um, bisexual, but strongly preferred men. So she finally realized that she had zero arousal or interest in sexual domination over men in her fantasies, but could be aroused and interested by herself as the dominant character if she was with another woman instead of a man. Um, but, and, you know, and was usually unable to be aroused by being submissive in her fantasies to another woman. And she, you know, it was on the page sort of like, oh my God, I'm a feminist and I'm endorsing um, these, these societal roles, these sexual stereotypes, yeah. um, sexual dominance and submission, male over female. Um, so this is how, how insidious it is. I mean, you know, and women who are saying, I do it because I enjoy it. Um, what is it that you're really enjoying and where did that come from? Who told you? Who told you? What's the, when, when's the first time? Go back and figure out and try and figure out when is the first time somebody told you or, or you thought, oh, this is good. This is pleasurable. Where did the idea come from that it's pleasurable? It doesn't just happen to know, but you can't create something that isn't there. Yeah, it was an interesting little essay, her little journey through figuring out yeah, and that sort of aha moment of like, oh, wow, it's not erotic to abuse men, but I can get a thrill when I abuse women. Um, and she's horrified by it. So that's good. And that's a good start. But uh, yeah, that was there. So I, it's, I don't know about you, Marion, but I've certainly known and heard of women who were lesbians who said, I can't find a good enough quote top that women don't hurt women enough. And so they would go and find male partners who would beat them up better than another woman would because yeah. the women just aren't cruel enough and they wanted the real thing. So they would find a man to be, you know, the, I, I don't want to use their cutesy words, like a man to abuse them and call it sex. So, right, right. yeah, because uh, women don't do it good enough. We're not, we're not vicious enough to women. So, yeah. Um, and as you know, to, to extend what was just, you know, what the previous essay said, there's another one talking about a sadomasochism feminist. And they're, again, critiquing the Samoa position. Um, Jeanette Nichols, um, Darlene Pagano, Margaret Rossoff, free choice and individualism um, are the, the basis of these arguments supporting that oppression. Um, so that s and encourages women to choose to accept their fantasies um, and sadomasochistic behaviors, but never questions why an individual would choose s and or where these fantasies arise from, which is what I just said. So S&M or Samoa that we're addressing says that the societal context of S&M is irrelevant. I don't know of anything in, in life um, where the societal um, context of S&M is irrelevant, except that maybe, you know, you have natural bodily functions like you, you know, urinate and defecate and sleep. I mean, I don't, you know, and even sleep, the societal context may be, irre may be relevant um, depending upon, you know, if you have to do shift work. Um, but feminism is a material analysis. So sadomasochistic desires are nurtured by the society in which we live. And this is always relevant. This is always relevant. Somebody's talking about eating an olive and it dried her mouth and went back to trying olives and eventually wanted them. Why did you keep trying them? Um, that's, I mean, in, in a, you know, I'm kind of glad somebody wrote that because um, my initial reaction of, re reaction was trying a new food um, is different than, um, I mean, hurting someone. Uh, yeah, I mean, the societal context of that really may not be relevant at all as to olives. I love olives and I know a lot of people hate them, um, but there is, you know, absolutely nothing that affects my personal relationships. 
except that, you know, I know that when I have certain people over, I can't cook using olives. So, yeah, we're on opposite ends of the olive spectrum here. Well, okay then, I think it's the Italian thing. Um, so our culture, I mean, our culture divides human attributes into two categories, you know, um, likely, you know, labeling some of them male, some of them female, and that's gender. Feminism, again, this is a feminist analysis. Women don't want or need the freedom to assume male stereotypes, like dominating and, and, and harming. Um, we, are, we are seeking the freedom to transcend any of the stereotypes, to not to, to get rid of the stereotypes. So, I mean, know, ultimately this, oh, go ahead. The, just the role playing in S&M was just developed in response um, to heterosexual models and it gives the relationships, um, you know, a feeling of legitimacy and normalcy. Roles are based on power and the imitation of power um, of man over woman if, if, if two women are doing it and, and it's the enactment if a man is doing it to a woman. And again, I mean, ask yourself, you know, where did this come from? How, when did you first think of that? I mean, how did that happen? Go ahead. Well, jumping off from that, I, I remember more than once having conversations, you know, like way back in the 80s. Uh, and, and I would have women say to me, just point blank, I cannot change what my father did to me, but I can learn to enjoy it. And they would say this as if it was like some kind of a triumph, that you're going to take your sexual abuse experience and learn to enjoy it. Like, how is that not just utter capitulation? And they honestly thought this was an argument for sadomasochism. And I was like, I don't know what kind of world you want, but I want a world where this doesn't happen to anyone, not that we've learned to enjoy it. <laughs> like, I, so we're after completely different things, you know? It, there's a, just a, and their, their view is so cynical to the sadomasochism. I mean, I read all the Samwell material, you know, like I did the deep dive into all that when it came out. And it's just very cynical because they keep asserting over and over that power is inevitable. They literally believe it. It is just, it's inevitable in human relationship. And again, what we can learn to do is to sexually enjoy it. That is their solution to the problem of political power. Um, you know, not a world that's egalitarian where this doesn't happen, but a world where uh, we keep the power, we keep the master slave, we keep the swastika and we just all learn to eroticize it. And that's, that's gonna be our freedom. Yeah, um, somebody is mentioning consent. One last word about that. Consent uh, in medical um, terms is, you sign consent when someone wants to do something to you that you would ordinarily never ever let them do because it is going to be painful or perhaps even mutilating of your body, um, something that is is otherwise unthinkable. And that's what consent means. Um, so when you're giving consent, you are someone is asking you to let them do something that they think somehow will benefit you or they've convinced you it'll benefit you. Um, that would otherwise be unthinkable and harmful. Um, so, you know, I, you know, um, men are afraid that if there is a so-called matriarchy, that women will treat them the way they treat women. Um, we don't want that. I mean, no. when, when men hate women, they want to rape and, and murder us. When women hate men, we just want to want them to go away and leave us alone and we'll have our, you know, little, uh, coffee clutch or whatever here. Yeah. You know? Custody of the kids. Get the kids away from him. Just leave yeah, us alone. Kid, you know, That's all the so, women ever want. Just let me yeah, take the kids so, and get out of here. That's it. Yeah. So I'm not, you know, it's it's um so it's not that we want matriarchy any more than patriarchy. We want uh, women are human and we want humanity for women. Yeah. Do you have any final words? We have a minute left later. Beating people up is not a good way to affirm anyone's humanity. That's all I got. All right. Um, it's great to have everybody here today. Um, thank you for coming and uh, we'll see you next week.